This is a, a sort of an open lecture, so nothing that we're going to be sharing uh, is private at all. You can feel free to, to tweet about it. You can take photos of the slides. Uh, we do have a hashtag that's, that's on every slide, so um, if you do want to have a conversation with us, you have comments or you have questions, uh, just engage with us on Facebook or Twitter. There you go, buzzword, engage, very good. Tick that box off. Um, yeah, so please just, you know, basically hop in and have a chat to us. I'm not sure that we're going to get time for questions at the end, uh, so if you do have any questions for us, please just do, just do jump on there. So today we're talking about more than luck, strategies for success on Steam. So who are we? I think half the room probably knows us. So speaking from the developer standpoint, we have Matt Trobiani. So Matt is a multi-award winning indie game developer and programmer um, from Team Fractal Alligator. So you'll know Matt as the creator from Hacknet and Hacknet Labyrinths. So he's speaking from the perspective of a developer that really him and his team used Steam absolutely to their advantage and really smashed it and continue to do so with features. I'm speaking from the marketer perspective. So I'm Lauren from Lumi Consulting. We work with developers across mobile, console, PC. Uh, we have experience with Steam, but my motivation for this talk was to really facilitate a conversation with Matt's big brain and how much he knows about Steam uh, and really just share everything that we've learned so far and the research that's coming out. So. We're going to be talking through a lot of things today. Keep on. I don't think this click is working. I'm just going to put that away. <laughs> so we're covering a lot of things today. Some of the main things that I want uh, you to take away is the way to develop a decision-making rationale. So let's go beyond uh, your gut instinct. Let's go beyond ideas. Let's go beyond what your buddy suggested that you should do. Let's develop a very robust decision-making rationale for your pathway to STEAM. We're going to explain a little bit about traffic, rankings, clicks, and conversion rates, and give you some really meaningful language uh, to use and to take back to your team. How to maximize time-limited opportunities on Steam as a store. And then I'll be talking until the cows come home about assets that your Steam page needs, uh, what they should be looking like, and why they're important. So Matt, I do believe that we have some news flash that has just come in overnight about I'll, I'll Steam. Cover it. I'll cover it later. OK, good, good. Be excited. We've got some breaking news, which is very excellent. And for now, I'm going to pass you on over to Matt. Alrighty, so we've got like a whole lot of stuff to get through, so I'm just going to get stuck in pretty much right away. Um, right at the start, I want to say we're going to be using a lot of words like success and failure here. Uh, we're talking about success as commercial success. So that's like making enough money to fund another or ideally like a couple more games after this. And commercial failure is not doing that. Um, and I know there are other kinds of success and things, but this is like one way of looking at it. So. Um, let's just get that out of the way right now. Like, it's a success if uh, it makes a bunch of money, and it's a failure if it doesn't. That's what we're like, our goal is here. So, we're going to talk about this in the context of trying to make a lot of money selling video games on Steam. Um, and that's what everything's like grounded by. So, uh, I think before we get stuck into this, the structure of the way this is going to work is the first half is going to be about like foundational knowledge and the way the systems uh, in Steam and in the marketplace as it is now actually work, uh, because understanding how those all work is like really fundamental to making correct decisions. There are a lot of choices you're going to run into and a lot of complex problems, and not understanding how the underlying system works is going to lead you the wrong way. So first I'm going to understand, uh, explain a whole bunch of, we're going to explain, a whole bunch of the way these systems actually work, and then the second half is going to be more actionable stuff and the consequences of that and things you should be doing right away. So first of all, the important part about all of this is how you make the decisions. At some point, you're going to be running into luck. Uh, and luck isn't some like big X machina thing that's impossible to like quantify and you should just pray to. Right? It's like more like a like a fog of war. You can chip away at it and reduce these unknown variables uh, with like research and testing and practice and understanding the way the systems actually work. So when we're talking about more than luck, we're talking about how to make a make decisions that remove as much as possible from the luck equation. And even given that there are going to be things that are outside of your control and understanding involved in it, you can still make the best possible decision with that knowledge. So let's begin. Uh, release week is by far your most important. And it's important to realize that it used to be, it's traditionally called a release week, but that's no longer the case. With uh, Steam Greenlight and Steam Direct, this is shrinking all the time. Um, like it was traditionally a week where your game was like on the front of the Steam store page, 
when Hacknet came out in 2015, uh, we squeezed out about three days of store, like front page of the store presence, uh, which was really good at the time. And nowadays you're going to be lucky if you can get a couple of hours out of that. This is your release window and it's the most important time in your entire product lifecycle, even though it's definitely not going to be your most profitable unless your game's a failure. So uh, what you're essentially doing during this time is building an effective like MMR. Does everyone here know what MMR is? It's like matchmaking ranking. When you're playing online games, your MMR determines like who you get matched up against and your effective place on the international leaderboards, right? And then when you get matched up against people, it'll match you up against people that are like around your relative MMR. This, this creates like good games and a roughly 50% win rate. This is like the concept of an MMR is pretty well known, but Steam's doing something like this internally to measure uh, how effective each game on their store is at selling copies and making money. Um, this works both for you and for Valve. So uh, your release window, the most important part in this is to establish a strong storefront MMR so that when they have a sale later on, uh, you'll be like put in it. They're not gonna put anyone there with like low MMRs on the front of their store page because that's incredibly valuable real estate. So uh, what's the ranking and how can we maximize it? It's gonna be a rough measure of how profitable you are per second. So let's do a rough calculation here. Let's assume that the same front page gets a thousand views per second. This is lowballing it by a lot. Uh, click rate of 5%, which is that 5% of the traffic that sees your little icon will click on your tile. Uh, that gives you 50 clicks per second. Uh, this is totally measurable and doable. Uh, you can get pretty good results like this based on like Facebook ads and stuff. Uh, Hacknet's click rate uh, depends where on the store it is. Some like tiles have a higher like uh, right, volatility than others. But um, yeah, we, we sat around 5% um, like click rate or something like that uh, based on all of the measurable like places we could measure it from. Uh, Steam front page won't give you this number, but it will give you your conversion rate, which is how many people visit your store page versus how many people buy it. Uh, Hacknet sat at about 5%, which is very high um, for a number of reasons we'll get into later. Uh, maximizing these two numbers is going to be the entire basis of bringing up your MMR and thus your like profitability. But you can calculate out per second that with a 5% click rate for that one tile at a 5% conversion rate, you're only up at 2.5 sales per second at a sale price of $10. That's $25 per second coming in, which seems like kind of low until you think about how many seconds we've been doing this talk for. And it's like, this is how Valve makes that money. This is lowballing it by a lot. So these numbers are all kind of nice and clean, but there's a lot of traffic rolling through the front page of the Steam. Uh, and your primary concerns are going to be maximizing the click rate and then maximizing conversion rate. Uh, these two numbers together gives you a rough measure of what your storefront MMR is going to be. Um, and Steam is not going to forget it. Uh, eventually you will slip off the front page, but your only chance of getting back there is to have like this strong proven first shot at it. Basically they're testing you, right? So when your game gets launched, they're gonna be driving a whole bunch of traffic to the page, like well, sort of. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit, but as long as you're on the new and trending list, there's gonna be a whole bunch of traffic that's gonna be seeing your little icon on it and you're getting a chance to show how high of a click rate you can get and then how high of a conversion rate you can get. You want your number like this to look as high as possible because after you're off the front page, uh, Steam's going to remember it. And they can always put you back on there. Steam's putting like games on the front page every single day and they have to rotate them. They can't just put the same ones on. Um, this is due to a bunch of their own internal metrics that they've measured that this is how customers best like to use their store. But uh, the two main ways you make money selling games on Steam is not from like new releases, it's through the midweek madness and week-long uh, sale slots. There's like a 24-hour sale and like a three-day sale, basically. So Hacknet sold like a whole lot of copies, but less than a 20th of its profit came in the first month. Um, and I can't, I, I, uh, I had the exact numbers, but I haven't written them down, but it's uh, a bit over a third, almost a half of its lifetime profit came from being in those sales slots. 
Uh, Valve don't sell them, but if they charged $100,000 for one of those slots for like a 24 hour position on that page, I'd buy it without thinking. It's worth a lot more than that. Um, so this is how games make money. Uh, combined with the presence in like the sales, like the, the Steam winter sale and like Christmas sale and whatever. Um, they're only gonna put the games that have like a high effective MMR uh, up into those like big juicy slots at the front of the page. And they've got to put something there and they're rotating them every day. And those slots are shockingly valuable because of the amount of traffic that's going through Steam. That click rate doesn't go away and 5% of visitors going to Steam, like the front page, 5% um, of the, the juicy visitors, the ones that are actually gonna end up buying something, is not an unreasonable amount to get um, clicking on one of those big icons at the top. Uh, and then your conversion rate will stay pretty constant. Um, so, I mean, it'll go up and down, but if you're going back to like the 5% click rate, 5% conversion rate, you might not even know they've put you there. And then suddenly you're making like $25 a second and it's really good. All right. So this brings us to one of the weirder controversial points is that it's okay if you make a loss during your launch as long as Valve makes a profit. So they're only gonna gauge this on their own side of things. You could be spending 100% of the money you get back from sales during your launch week on advertising to keep pushing external traffic to it. And that's gonna do nothing except increase your MMR. You should all be like embracing this idea that your launch week is not there to make you money. It's there to establish a strong sales record so that Valve feels justified in putting you back on the front of the store, which is where you'll make your actual money. Right, so because the uh, launch week is effectively your like placement matches in MMR, they have the highest volatility. So they'll change you, uh, your position in Valve's uh, perceived rankings so much more because it's earlier on. And then as your sales normalize, it'll like settle out to where it thinks you really belong. Right, so this will change over time, but not before you have made heaps of money. Um, like if you can establish a strong sales record right off the bat, that's how you become profitable. And it doesn't mean that you have to make money right away. So it's worth investing really hard at the start, even if you spend all of your like launch profits in order to establish this. Laura? Yep, cool. So spicing up your click rate with distinctive branding. I'm not gonna Freudian slip that one this time. Um, so basically, I really would like to encourage all developers to think about not only selling their game on Steam, but selling their game within Steam. So you need to get clicks and you need to get conversion in the Steam environment. A really good way to test your branding is like basically doing a Photoshop mock-up of your key art as though it's on the new and trending and think, does this look distinctive in comparison to other titles that are on there? Do, do those key assets actually have the level of polish and legibility that would be expected? If I show people who I feel are in the target market for my game, this mocked up storefront and say, you've got 20 bucks, how do you wanna spend it on that list? See if they're going to, you know, finger press on, on, your, on your icon. Really test your branding and test it within the Steam ecosystem a whole lot, which is something that I don't see developers try enough. So it really is about standing out. It's not about being, you want to stand out. You also want it to truly reflect the game experience because the standing out part gets you the clicks. The conversion is if you're giving a really unified impression. If your key art makes it look like a sci-fi game but I click through and it's very clearly horror, there's gonna be a bit of incongruence and the conversion rate's not gonna be great. So I'll go very tactically into this um, a little bit later on, but just holistically having the mindset of how can I sell my game within the Steam context? Do my key art and my key assets, are they really up to, up to snuff in comparison of what's on there all the time? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll follow that with something else is that good reviews usually become from people feeling that the marketing materials that push them into the purchase are in sync with the experience that the purchase itself gives them, right? So your, your game doesn't necessarily have to be like just gameplay footage, but it should reflect the experience that people will have uh, playing it. So a good example of this that's a bit counterintuitive is uh, like the Stanley Parable, which had like their trailer was, and all their marketing materials were just like a completely different game. It had nothing to do with it. But it was the same fundamental experience, so that if people liked those marketing materials, then they were going to connect with the game in a similar way. So they got positive reviews. Uh, where this goes wrong is where the, like the marketing materials 
give people a wrong expectation and then your game will probably review tank immediately, which is another way that you can ruin your launch week. So aggressive honesty is really important. So I could but even do like a No Man's Sky particular case study on that as an issue um, and basically the pros and cons of the way their marketing team marketed it and the way Sony marketed it as well, causing that incongruence that was not the developer's fault. But that's a presentation for another day. All right, so the new and trending list, which is formerly the popular new releases list. Um, so when you launch on Steam, you're given your first opportunity to make it to the front page. You're not put there by default anymore because you're gonna start buried. Uh, you're gonna need people that are going to go and look for your game specifically and buy it uh, because it's not gonna be on the front page. This is called your core traffic. These are people that are gonna buy your game regardless of how good your marketing materials are. Uh, so a big part of the marketing roll-up towards launch is going to be establishing enough core traffic to move your game from that list into the view of the public so that you can start getting the natural traffic, which is people that might have heard of it, but they weren't ever going to go to the store to type into the box. Right? So here's how the list works. It's basically the highest MMR games that are on Steam right now with a modifier placed for time since launch. So this is like uh, if every, like, 24 hours or 12 hours you spend on there, you, get, you have to be performing so much higher than the next person on that list, otherwise you're gonna get knocked down a spot. Um, so it's pretty difficult to stay there like two days in this ecosystem and nothing survives more than five days on this list. PUBG didn't, you're not going to, right? So just give up on that right now. Like, uh, so you wanna be moving from the, uh, and how long you stay on that list um, is dependent on your like effective storefront MMR and your click rate and your uh, conversion rate. Your conversion rate's gonna look awesome because only people that see your page are gonna do that. But that's useless without the multiplier for click rate, which is gonna be effectively zero, so you're gonna tank anyway. So you need to very quickly move from the new releases list to the trending list, right? Um, we'll explain how to do that in just a minute. Uh, so Matt, do we wanna do the news flash? Do you wanna share uh, the Yeah, news? yeah, okay, yeah. Yep. So uh, exciting, horrifying news that <laughs> Steam's just put out. They've very quietly moved their storefront from being um, one storefront trending list for everywhere in the world to being uh, region specific. This happened pretty recently, as in in the last couple of weeks, um, and it's had some pretty profound effects on some games that have just come out, but this means that localizing is more important than ever because you're not gonna be moving from the like new releases list to the popular new releases list, even if all of your marketing materials are amazing in a region that can't play your game. Um, this is, a really big deal, and I just found out about it just before. Um, but oh, just off the top of my head, I think it's gonna make uh, localizing at launch lots more important, which is unfortunate because that was one of the juicy things that you could like bully Steam into giving you like a front page sales slot for, just being like, oh, I'm localizing it now, because they love that, even if your actual players don't really care because like they've already played it, um, which was like an interesting consequence, but that's now basically gone because you're going to need to be focusing on like all of the regions individually at launch, um, like you might notice that like if you do launch now, you'll like end up in the new and trending, but like the sales figures aren't what you hoped, you might just be new and trending in Australia or nowhere else. Um, so that's gonna change things as well. Mm. Launch Beautiful, time. yes, so launch timing. So we will go into some specifics on this. When it comes to launch, launch timing, your mileage may vary. It will depend on things like your genre, how your genre performs in certain regions. This new sort of region aspect uh, is going to affect things as well. So we are gonna be talking in some, in some generalities. And I can just say having a really good uh, sort of marketing and release plan totally trumps just picking, picking one certain day. You can't just pick one certain day and say, this is the golden day and I don't have to prepare for it very diligently. So really the, the plan with a lot more layers to it is really important for a successful launch. Uh, I'll have a quick note here is that the hour of your launch can also matter. Um, you wanna be thinking about everything. Basically, because uh, moving from the new releases list to the popular new releases list, it's effectively, you're effectively climbing up from like below the visible top 10, right? Um, but like moving up space in that list gets a lot harder over time, over like hours of time, right? You start ticking as soon as your launch has actually happened. Um, and you wanna be on that list within like, on every region you can be within like 30 minutes, an hour of launch, because that's how you establish like a truly shocking strong MMR, because there's so much traffic that's gone through your icon compared to everyone else's. In like, from Valve's mind, it's like, oh, this game's out for five days and it got like 
you know, hundreds of thousands of impressions or whatever, that's so much better than someone who got like moved onto that list a lot later, even if they have the same click and conversion rates. So it needs to happen immediately. Uh, so this means you should be conscious about launching when your like biggest predicted target market is going to be buying. Okay, so like think about like if your biggest target market is like North America, which is like probably the default one, uh, you want to be launching at a time when they're going to start seeing it and buying it as soon as possible, especially if that's like where your core traffic is. Um, but you want to be like moving onto that list, uh, like the in, like the visible list as soon as possible mm -hmm. and like just start pushing numbers through. And just as a note, this regional storefront change might make, uh, make a really strong case for partnering with a local region specific publisher. So you had experience being published by Surprise Attack based in Australia. This region change might mean that it makes really good sense to partner with someone just for APAC uh, or just for Europe so that they can really activate really strong core traffic to direct straight away and really know that kind of pathway to market. So that might be a change that we see as well. I'm really interested to see how it changes um, basically me and my colleagues and how we approach things. So some general launch timing, timing tips. Always be aware of how rational your estimated release window is. I always uh, encourage teams to sit down with all of their stakeholders, select first a release season of a release year for your region, get a little bit further and then select a month, get a bit further and select a week, then get a bit further and select a day. Once you've internally agreed on those tightening release windows, you don't have to go public with it. Go public purposefully and carefully with advice from professionals. But internally, I always recommend no, no a season, no a month, no a week, and then, then no a day, and kind of test that understanding. Research your competitor release dates um, or their quarters and avoid them. So talking about having a really strong MMR, being very distinctive, and then if someone clicks through, being super attractive for a purchase, it's really good to know when am I going to accidentally split because someone, someone else who's making a game that goes for the same target market as me will release in the same day or in the same week. Research as much as you can to be aware and really, really space it out just so that you're not parting the seas of all the people that come through onto Steam because someone else is doing a procedurally generated dungeon crawler that week, for example. Uh, avoid overload seasons. So that has to do a lot with core traffic. So overload seasons of December and early January, content creators and media kind of just go to sleep. They put a bunch of work in the can, they've worked super hard all year and they do tend to actually go and see family, which I'm glad about. But it does mean that those methods of core and natural traffic will go a little bit quieter over that season. Also, there's a blessing and a curse of a lot of people going to the Steam storefront over December and January to make a AAA purchase. Some of them might flow over to you as well because they've, they've already got their wallet out, so to speak. But for me, I don't really like it because making a splash with content creators and media is really hard over that period. Uh, and also intense buzz periods. E3 in June, etc. cetera, uh, there's just news just drowning all of the media and all the content creators and everyone's doing reaction videos. It's very hard to get them to open your email specifically um, over that period of time. So if you've got a really important announcement or a release, just avoid those kinds of periods. So Matt and I have some different opinions on days of the week, um, but a lot of other people ask. So for us, we really like a US Wednesday or Thursday. That gives enough time to basically distribute review codes to content creators well in advance. And then for ones that maybe aren't tier one, more review code distribution uh, later on. And then letting people basically hopefully be on new and trending as people go, oh, I'm going to pick up an indie game for the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and then be on that list and make that purchase and carry it through to the weekend as well. But you have a slightly different view. Yeah, uh, I actually agree with you now, but there used to be this uh, cute, little, cute little trick that you could pull where basically uh, like because Valve employees aren't supposed to work on Saturday, Sunday. They have an internal rule where they don't release games on Saturday, Sunday. So like the, uh, the like dampening effect of uh, the new releases like all coming out is effectively like, like less powerful on Saturday, Sunday. So you could release on a Friday and if you pick the right timing, you'll release it so like the Valve employees will put it out just before they go home. And then you can just coast through the entire weekend on the front page and like nothing's allowed to come out to replace you. Um, but like uh, they're automating this with Steam Direct stuff so it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> but, um, like, but I used that trick and it was great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> womp womp, yeah. oh wait. 
I've also got some more. <laughs> All right, yeah, go. Ahead. Yep, cool. So um, also just really be very practical about when your VIPs can most effectively support you. So your stakeholders, your family and friends, the dev team, the media that you've made friends with, the colleagues that you have, because they can all be activated and help drive core traffic. If all of those stakeholders are just in one region, this may now cause an issue for regional storefronts. But uh, based on the old rules, um, that, that's definitely very useful. Some people will pick an hour uh, for a release on a certain day. That means all the dev team want to be up and having a champagne party for the launch, but it's at 2 a.m. local time. If it is, practice getting up at 2 a.m. Um, you don't want someone to accidentally sleep through or be super sleep deprived or just feel super weird because they're basically kind of have to train for the release day and the release hour if it's not when you're usually awake. Uh, so definitely have reasons to make decisions, but weigh all of those decisions up together and make that decision as a team. Uh, you want to avoid AAA releases. If that's, if that's you, um, aiming for February or August potentially as, as months. We all know scope creep um, and you know, production drag just happens. So your first month you know, in the golden field of opportunities when no, nothing's gone wrong yet, you might want to choose one of these months, but just be aware that you know, your mileage may vary, things definitely come up, and these are all really, really rough points. Um, and yeah, I've talked about basically having a strong release plan. The release day is only one factor. So we want you to take a lot of different things away from this talk, but even if it's just like 10% of what we say distributed, make sure it's in a few different elements and not just like one point that you take away and get tattooed on, on your body. <laughs> Do you consider tattoos though? Um, yeah, yeah, it's good, a good accessory. Alrighty. Um, so just before we move on, I want to like make this part super clear. You got two types of traffic here, core and natural traffic. Uh, your core traffic's basically useful for only one thing at the very start, and that's like from moving you over from like the new releases list into the popular new re releases list and like putting you at the highest point you can get there, right? Almost all of your sales are going to come from natural traffic just because as we described before, the Steam front page generates so much traffic that you're going to need to be converting those people into sales because you can't convince a million people to go onto Steam and search for your game and download it. Like it, it's, it's so hard. Um, but you can influence them and like have them seen it. So when they're just cruising through the front page, they're more likely to click on yours in Blue click rate. And then like you have really good store materials. So when they're there, they're like, oh, this is like cheap and it looks cool. I'll just buy it in Blue click rate. Hi, MMR. There we go. All right. So let's recap. Um, the plan basically looks like this. Pre-launch, you want to you wanna establish a core audience that immediately buys the game to bump into view. You don't need that many of these, but these are the hardest to generate. Uh, during launch, you want to be converting enough public attention into sales to establish a higher storefront MMR. And then after launch, you want to use that MMR to actually make money. All right. So successful launch is very important. Your launch performance determines your MMR. You need to be in the trending list. This is not optional. Uh, and you need to be in the trending list in as many regions as possible now, which makes this a lot harder. Yeah. Um, you trend by having good core traffic and good marketing materials and like following a solid marketing plan that understands how to convert natural traffic into sales and then you stay by converting that natural traffic well. All right, so this is like all the fundamentals of how the systems work and like what kinds of traffic you need and where you need them to be. So how do we build both kinds of traffic in the volumes that you, we need and we start priming the natural traffic to start buying the game as soon as we get there. Let's start. Store materials, Lauren. We're here, store materials. So this is a lot of our job um, at Lumi Consulting to give direction and planning and making sure that all these different marketing assets get made. We give them feedback, we give them tweaks, we make sure everything gets made well in advance before anybody is like panicking to hit the release button. So you can have a lot of fun with store materials. Um, a good market is never going to tell you to make store materials that feel wrong for your game. It's all about facilitating basically your unique selling points and the superpowers of, of your game. So you need to be happy with your store materials, but give them a lot of uh, time and attention. So tips for high conversion storefronts. We've talked about this a little bit. Um, I really like using um, Dream Daddies as an example. So Dream Daddies did a really good job of establishing very, very, very strong core. Having really, really, really good core traffic community meant that when the game came out, 
and we were all super hyped for it. We immediately went, we immediately made purchases. They had heaps of wish lists. Wish listing is a really good, is a really good tool to track as a developer. But then once you went there, everything is super on point. Everything is like dream daddies, romance, dads, gay stuff, awesome. So you basically, it did convert really well. Lots of clicks, it stood out enormously. It had romantic, pink, flowy writing. Like, I, it's very rare to see that on the Steam page. And then once you click through, everything was, was in line. So it has very distinctive um, game logo and key art. I do want to stress you need to test that a lot. Mock it up, test, test, test. Um, you want a snappy mini description. If I read that description below your key art and it sounds like any type of game, it's very hard for me to look over and go, Matt, saw this cool Dream Daddies game, but you know, it was kind of saying that I click through things and that there's UI boxes. Mm. You know, like you need to you need to basically highlight emotive keywords that are really really memorable. Uh, and also looking alive, posting updates. This is really good for basically conversion. So people can see, oh, this game is alive. They are posting updates, whether it's early access or the updates you posted before it went live. It's also for media. If I pitch the media, but they click through and my team hasn't made an update for months and months, like dead tumbleweeds rolling through, it's very hard for the media to say, well, should I put effort into this type of, into this kind of content? Blah, blah, blah. Um, I really like embedding GIFs in, your, GIFs in your store copy and updates. Really good examples are Armello and Forts locally. They use GIFs in their, in their update body copy as well. It's really, really good. People are visual creatures. Give them something to look at. Don't just do like 10 GIFs back to back and make it really chuggy to load. Hashtag Australian internet. But it's, it's really, really fun and a good idea to chuck it in there. And again, test to see which, which GIFs people love the most. Using your Twitter GIF posting can be a really good way to take the temperature of which GIFs people love the most. Uh, graphically designed headers. This is pretty easy. This is a feature, a feature header from the Ticket to Earth Steam page. So you can replace that default white Steam text with your own graphic designed headers. Doesn't take too much for your artist to do that. Looks really, really polished. Um, and I definitely encourage you to add that to your pages including validation from review quotes, um, award laurels, etc. If you've got coverage from something like Kotaku or GameSpot for a preview, chuck a little quote in there that really captures the soul of the game. Uh, if you don't have that yet, maybe just ask, you know, do you know a prominent developer? Do you know someone else notable? Get them to play it and then just get a little quote from them as well if you can't get media. And if you're an award-winning developer like Matt, then you could include award laurels as well, which looks really good. It's validation. Think, if you think about what makes a stranger buy a game they've never heard about, um, really try and get that mindset. And really try and find as many people as you can that aren't game developers to give you feedback on your store. It's like having a mocked up Kickstarter page. You really should show that to people before it goes live so you can figure out what your weak spots are and improve it before you're in that really important new and trending window. Uh, yeah, emotive and focused screenshots and trailers. And again, that's just focusing on the emotional experience, the best emotional experience that a player can have in game. Make sure that the screenshots are basically representative as well. Cool. So the trailer. Now, this is going to be the most important part of this talk. Uh, I think the trailer is the number one most critical asset in your marketing campaign, and it's pretty much the make or break. So I'm just going to read this out. This is from Chris Wright, the uh, Managing Director of Surprise Stack, who published Hagnet. Trailer views are a combination of exposure for the trailer, like how many sites run it, uh, virality, and engagement. Virality is basically like how likely someone is to share it after seeing it, and engagement is how much they're engaging with the trailer, like writing comments and like talking about it, stuff like that. Um, so that's how you maximize trailer views, and that's also like a pretty excellent metric for how well the trailer is selling the game itself. So I'm just going to like lay this out there. The uh, selling in video game on Steam is like a very difficult target to hit. There are so many moving parts that's very complicated. So you can pretty much replace that entire challenge with this one, and you will sell a lot of copies of your game on Steam. You need to put out a trailer of your game exactly three weeks before launch date. And if it has 100,000 views before your game comes out, you're going to do fine. And that's pretty much it. Um, so like, let me make this absolutely clear. Everyone here that's launching a game, if your launch trailer, like your like pre-launch trailer, doesn't have 100,000 views when you're about to launch, you're not going to make it. Right? It's, you don't have enough. Um, and if you think you're the exception to the rule, you've already given up hope on being a commercial success. Uh, like this is really important. And that's like difficult, but it's not as difficult as selling 100,000 copies of a game without doing this. 
All right. So the trailer goal is 100,000 views. Yes, absolutely. So with everything that we're saying, if this totally freaks out anybody, um, I would like to point out that it's a very good goal to have because it's a goal you can test before you actually release. So if you release a trailer and it's just not getting traction, let's go back to the writing board and drawing board and then let's let's try again. Like as a team, let's explore different elements, let's cut it differently, let's let's revisit it basically. And it's still a golden opportunity you haven't released yet. So if you're finding that hard, uh, it might be time to get professional help if you don't have it. Otherwise, it's time to talk really frankly as a team about how you can how you can basically have another have another go at it, um, repackage it, change the strategy a little bit. So trailers, it's a, just a really good guide to look at a lot of trailers. When E3 happens, basically have a look at the hashtag and see which trailers blow everybody's minds, uh, and then. Yeah, basically trailers are a really, really, really good test. Trailers are tricky because it's a marketing asset that you're giving to someone that they must passively experience. Giving someone a game is an active, engaged experience. So the way you engage someone through a trailer is going to be different than the way you engage someone through gameplay. It's, it's subtle, but it is different. So does your trailer nail the best emotional experience that players can have? It should be genuine to the way a player can feel, but it should focus on the ideal emotional experience that someone can have while playing. I always say to focus on your flavor and not your ingredients. I don't like to see a list of key features. I like to see an immersive experience that has music, gameplay cuts, uh, and basically what you're focusing on that delivers the flavor of your game. How does it feel to play? Don't just tell me that it's a roguelite platformer. That's not interesting, but show me the way I'm going to feel when I'm playing it. Select punchy, evocative music selected for purpose. One of the most common mistakes I see with trailers is that someone just cuts gameplay and they just use the background music that they would have in their gameplay. I really recommend that you work with a professional, keep a little bit of budget back to get custom music for, for trailers. There's some great audio guys in the room, hey! Like, you should definitely talk to them because talking about it being a passively, a passively absorbed thing means that the music has to be super grabby. It's probably going to be louder and more in your face than anything you'd actually have moment to moment in your gameplay, but you do really need that engagement. So I, I would definitely recommend studying the Hacknet trailer. They did an awesome job. The other world agency, I believe, did the music for that one, did they? Uh, sort of. Sort I of. worked directly with like one of the artists on the game. Beautiful. Yeah. It's a really good trailer to study. The music in that is super exciting. It's, it's a very good example. Play as a goldfish. Start strong. Uh, you can be a little bit evocative, but you need to basically test it to see, is someone, is someone bored? Am I letting the tension drop, basically? And it is just all about testing. Test with the target market, not just developers, and ask questions. Trailers are something that you can draft. It's another common mistake I see where someone cuts the trailer and releases the trailer. They didn't privately show it to anybody. Do a whole lot of testing and ask for a whole lot of feedback. Trailers are so important that Matt and I want you to study every second that you have in the trailer and how effective it is. Uh, end the trailer with a call to action. So let's say that it's a preview trailer. So I've got a call to action example from After You, which is the horror game just announced by Andy Sum, who I believe might be in the room. Uh, we made sure that it had a call to action because it was an announcement of a title. I needed to make it really obvious that you could take an action to become part of the core audience for this game and not just be like, that was cool. Well, back to Facebook. I wanted someone to go, that was cool. I'm going to tweet that I just watched this trailer. I'm going to follow them on Twitter. And then they've joined my like core traffic army. So make sure you have a call to action card at the end. Study the best trailers in and out of your genre. Study the best trailers in different forms of media. Study boring, bad trailers as well and think, well, I got bored or I looked over here or I checked my phone. And like, why did you do that? What happened right before you looked away? Tip, get a professional. Um, I've used Jason Poley a lot as a local uh, kind of like video trailer producer who's excellent. Um, my, the game developers that I work with, they're not objective about their own work. They want to keep gameplay in because it shows the really cool feature that was very hard to implement. And, you know, and I'm another step back of objective to say, no, cut it. But then again, the trailer, the trailer producer is often another step of objective. And he's like, no, this is what works. So it's a really good spot to keep a little bit of budget back for a professional. Um, yeah, and I think, Matt, I think you feel the same about not cutting it yourself. Yeah, yeah. So this is something that uh, like I learned after like cutting together my own trailers that don't cut it together yourself. You'll get attached to the mechanical work of it. Um, you'll be like, oh, I really like how these pieces came together. And you'll lose all your objectivity of being like, is this actually the best way to like convey this, right? Um, I think trailers like are pretty good around like 60 seconds or something. You don't need them to be super long. 
but just just pay someone to cut it together and like get them to send you a version of it and then write like response about things you want to change. I wrote 3,000 words in response to the first 17 seconds of the last like hacknet trail to this poor guy. Um, but like it was worth it, right? Because we could just keep making revisions um, and like pay them for it. It's not wasted money. It's like an investment in your marketing in the most important part of your marketing. Um, so don't, don't cut it together yourself if like you have any way to not do that. A um, couple of other small points to what you yes. said. The ending the trailer with the call to action is good for converting people that would otherwise be like just boosted natural traffic into core traffic. And play as a goldfish, start strong. Like don't start it with your logo, no one cares. <laughs> like start it with something cool. Alrighty, so uh, if the trailer is the most important asset, um, then dealing with the media is where your thinking and your like processes are most important and making like good decisions. So. A lot of traditional advice says you should be starting your marketing like immediately with the game. You should be rolling for like months and months. I know this is a little bit against what Lauren recommends, <laughs> but um, I don't think that's strictly necessary. It's mostly about having like a plan for when you're going to approach the media and like what articles you want to get written. Uh, so to that end, like condense your media pushes. Uh, consider the case where you like send uh, the, some media people or all of the media people like an email that says like, oh, I'm making this game, here's the name of it, here's a couple of screenshots, it's gonna be good, right? Like they're like, all right, we don't have a trailer or anything, we'll write about it later. Like you, later on you send them the trailer, like one or two of those people had written like scraps about it. They're like, oh, this game's already announced, it's kind of like whatever, we'll write about it on launch day, right? Like the longer you like feed them little bits and pieces, if you like, no one cares about when you've chosen to like launch the game, like if they've never heard of it before and like, if like you're just announcing the name of the game, that's like not enough. No one cares. Um, with Hacknet, we did exactly one media push uh, three weeks before launch, which is where we got the trailer out. Uh, we sent it to everyone at the same time with like the name of it and screenshots, and the trailer and the release date, and like everything uh, all at the same time. And it sort of like came out of nowhere and went for like the big flash because we were all in on maximizing virality on the trailer. And by having a lot of other people talking about it at the same time has this weird effect of making you feel more justified about talking about it yourself. So um, by having it all super condensed for that game, um, that was a strategy that really worked for us, um, which meant that like the trailer got a lot of shares um, and uh, like started that kickoff. So uh, if you want to know the actual numbers, we got uh, our biggest jump from the media was PC Gamers article about it, drove 20,000 views to the trailer. Uh, Kotaku did something like uh, nine or 10,000. Uh, combined across all media, there was about like 35, 40,000 trailer views. And then uh, because of this like viral effect, people would be sharing it. And so that just kept climbing up until we were about 130 something thousand at launch, um, which was enough, right? Like we crossed the line. Uh, but you've got to have like a plan for it. So dealing with the media and making sure that they have something they can work with uh, is really important. So the key point number one is that writers are people too. You're gonna to have to consider who they are and what they want. Their job is to provide information and entertainment to their readership. So they can't report on everything they get sent. If you've ever seen one of their inboxes, it's crazy. There's just like, a, like thousands of emails every day with people thinking they're like the most generous person on earth because they've sent them a Steam key, right? They get lots of Steam keys and like they can't report on all of it. So by definition, they have to have some sort of uh, like rationale by which they select what does and doesn't get written about. So what's the best way to find out that rationale? It's like probably to just go and talk to them and like meet them in person. There's gonna be a whole bunch of media at Melbourne International Games Week and work out what they do to separate out like their things that they don't get written about and things that do, right? But I know you're not gonna do that, so I went and did it for you. So this is uh, Jason Imms, who's a freelance writer. Most of your indie stuff is going to be from freelancers. Um, he's written at all of the ones down the bottom that you probably like and think. And here's exactly what he said in response to that, is that easiest to write about is good and will grab readers attention is better. Um, so you need to be considering what makes your story interesting. Why does it stand out? Why should they write about you and not someone else? Publications have preferences and so do individual journos. Know what they're into and what they often cover and what they're passionate about. See if you've got an angle with your game for them specifically. And don't send out big press releases, as Lauren was saying, during times when they're going to be busy. Um, Jason has some excellent talks about covering this on O'Reilly Media, so just like search for his name and that, and you should find out more from there. And this is from Mark Searles, who's the managing editor at Kotaku. He says, 
uh, it helps to have an angle and to have a story. So he's much more story focused um, than uh, Jason. He has much more like longer article pieces. Um, he says that it's useful to facilitate the writing of the articles to have that story. Uh, I've lost track of the times I've been shut down because the story I want to write doesn't necessarily hit the key messaging of a product the developer or a publisher wants to sell. Just to let us uh, tell your story. Trust the journalist to understand their own audience. Just to jump in there, that is a pretty significant difference when it comes to content creators, streamers and let's players versus the rest of, of games media. Games media really care about you as a person. They're very interested in you and your personal story. So Matt, having a history in infosec and things like that made your development of Hacknet really interesting and there was a story there to report on and a lot of the media engaged with that. Content creators generally won't know you as a person, often don't care about you as a person, which I don't mean just as a criticism, but they're just going to jump straight into the gameplay. So if you haven't thought before about your unique selling points as a person or as a team, start to think about them because the media are people. They'd like to engage with you as a person and they really like sharing personal stories. Your end consumers and content creators might not super care. Some core traffic will, but the media definitely do care. Uh, yeah, uh, so... Uh, something that Laura and I have talked about a whole bunch is uh, test writing an article that you want to see. Like, look at a website and look at the style of like writing that's out there. Like, go look at the articles on the front page of Giant Bomb or whatever, if that's where you want to be, and see what those articles look like, and uh, write that article yourself. Absolutely. If you can't write that article, or if that article seems super not genuine, then you need to really think about what your expectations are, or what you might need to add or take away to be able to actually get exciting coverage. Have you highlighted things that are exciting about your game? Yeah, um, so this is actually like really difficult and like sort of boring and hard, but it will actually teach you a whole lot, um, mostly because you'll find yourself wanting to like insert quotes from yourself into the article, right? And like stuff like that. And this is like, this sounds funny, but like it's really helpful. And you know what you should do when you send the email to that particular publication? Just give them a bunch of quotes from yourself in the email. Be like, here's some stuff I've said about the game. Here's a couple of angles on it, right? Like, it's not just about, like, here's my game in the trailer, just put it up for me, please. Like, give them stuff to work with, right? They're, like, they're people and they're looking for, like, what's not only easy to write about, so you're doing a bunch of this stuff for them. You don't want them to come, having to come chase to you. But you want, like, all of your stuff in that email right off the bat, right? Like, here's your Steam keys and the trailer links and the screenshots and everything's, like, properly high res and the sort of stuff they use. Um, and here's a bunch of quotes and how you can contact me and, like, a couple of angles you might be interested on this. Mm. Um, like give them things to work with because they're people as well. Alrighty, so the last one's engagement. Beautiful, okay, so engagement. We're running low on time, so I'm gonna show you a couple of slides that have tables. This is basically how I rank my recommendations for doing different types of marketing activities. They're ranked by return on investment. Some of them are cheap, some of them are expensive, but I rank it by awesome, good, and meh. So, uh, so basically this slide and the next slide are really good to take a photo. If you're, uh, I really commonly get questions of, what do you think about Twitter versus Facebook? Matt and I would basically just be like, Facebook ads, not Twitter. Yeah, so I invested a whole bunch of money in like testing all of them. We got like a, like a control week and then we did a bunch of different weeks with like, here's the Twitter ads and here's the effect of the Facebook ads with like the different prices and stuff. Just do Facebook, there you go, that's the answer. I paid a lot of money for that. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt and I don't have time to publicly debate in front of you, but we do have some different feelings about some of these. Can we do just one, just the so, Twitter account one? Yeah, yeah, he'd like yeah. to fight with me about Twitter. All right. Um, yeah, don't do Twitter marketing, it's stupid. Do right, Twitter like how many, people, how many people follow your Twitter account? Like 400, that's your market saturation. Like, all right, buddy, 100,000 views, good luck, right? Like 400 people, like you're spending hours on it, don't, don't do it. But for me, I'm super into Twitter marketing because it's very important to the core market and it helps you get in the habit of establishing your own momentum of communication with people. So it, it's, it's not... It's not good to have Twitter be the beginning and the end of your marketing strategy. That would be really, really negligent, but it's a very good way to test the temperature of how do people like this screenshot, this GIF, how do they like this pitch? I'm gonna ask some opinions, I'm gonna ask some polls. And also it can be a really good pick-me-up. Like game development can be really lonely, so talking to people through Twitter or getting feedback through Twitter can feel really, really good, but it isn't the beginning and the end of, of your marketing strategy. Yeah, I will agree that it's 100% the best way to engage with your core traffic. Cool. So this is the second slide as well. Uh, we're getting up to time, so I do just want to give you an opportunity to take a photo um, if you want. You can talk to me about any of these if I've used any language or jargon that's a little bit confusing. Just tweet me or ask. 
Um, yeah, basically, I'm happy to talk about these things forever and ever, but you could just take this and print it off and stick it on the wall and then figure out your budget that way, basically. Yeah. Woo. Alrighty, uh, I'm not going to cover after launch stuff because we're out of time. But um, we at didn't that point, prepare anything anyway. <laughs> at that point, like, uh, like it's mostly important to just like keep thinking about like the decisions you're making, right? Like, again, don't forget those Steam sales slots, like the midweek madness and the daily deals. I think they call them, right? Those are how you make money. Um, yeah. So, uh, key takeaways here: number one, you got to get that high store MMR. It's more important than making money in your launch like window get high store MMR. Uh, trailer views correlate very closely to sales. Seriously, go on YouTube and look up games that have done well and games that haven't. Look how many like views their thing does. Do you think people like like the game heaps and then go back and watch the trailer like a hundred times? Like maybe a couple of people, but like <laughs> almost all of those people that turned into sales, right? Like it works, they correlate really closely. Your goal needs to be 100,000 trailer views. Um, think very carefully about your media contact and timing. Don't just start spraying stuff all over the place. Like uh, managing uh, them and how you interact with them is really important. Um, consider condensing your media pushes, consider the angles and stories that you might have available. I'd also recommend like try and meet the media, follow them on Twitter. I can tell you right now they won't check all their emails, but they'll definitely check their Twitter notifications. You can sneak in there um, and build that core audience. Um, all right, so we don't have much time for questions, but I've got a couple of rapid fire ones that you probably should be asking, so I'm just going to run over them really quickly. <laughs> Number one, how will we know if I've generated enough core traffic? 100,000 trailer views. Question two, what do I do if I can't seem to get that many trailer views no matter what? Okay, this one's really serious. At this point, you're in trouble and you need help and you cannot do it yourself. Uh, this probably means that it's not something that you or your team have the capability to do alone, so you should be seeking professional help like Lumi Consulting does consulting, right? Like marketing <laughs> firms do marketing. There are professionals that are available to help there and you should find someone else. Um, three weeks out gives you a week to see if this is actually working. And if you don't have like 20, 30,000 views in a week, then you know that this is not trending in a good direction. And you still have two weeks to not just throw away your dream, right? Like start making decisions and just be honest and open with yourself. It's going to be a really rough time, but that's the time to start making divisive, decisive moves. Um, all right, question. Is it important to generate your own traffic to send to Steam? Not really. They generate so much itself. Your core traffic, maybe, like send what you can there, but otherwise, like, just focus on converting what's already there. Um, and yeah, uh, another question. What's the role of publishers in all this? Uh, they're really good at squeezing the most money out of your, the MMR that you produce. Uh, they're also a team of highly trained professionals that you can ask questions about, like, is this a good store copy instead of just, you know, whoever's around. Um, they're professionals. They've done lots of them. Um, they're mostly good to just ask questions about like that. You could hire a marketing firm or a consulting firm to ask those questions to as well. But the main benefit of a publisher is that they're well trained on squeezing money out of Emma. Beautiful. So I think this is going to be the end of our time. I just want to stress that we really enjoy talking about this. We really care about you. We want you to do really, really well. That's why we're up here chatting about it. And um, I just wanted to thank Matt for being really frank and talking personally about his own numbers. Um, that's really, really brave. Um, so yeah, round of applause for Matt and for you for listening. Uh, thanks, and round of applause for Lauren too.